that led Sri Arun Jetli inaugurated Bandhan Bank in a high profile event in Kolkata. And this has been a journey that all of us at Bandhan Bank feel blessed to be a part of. Today, we have a 4,559 banking outlets in 34 states and union territory of the 37. We are fortunate to have owned the trust and love of over two crores customers. When we started off as a bank, we had about 13,000 employees. And today, our employees count stands at about 42,000. We have always been privileged with the trust and confidence of millions of people. In my mind, deposits are a true measure of customers' confidence in the bank. Our total deposits stands at over 60,000 crores, showing the trust that customers have in us. Our total advances stand at over 74,000 crore and our net NPA stands at a low 0.58%, indicating the good quality of the asset book and yet again, the strong customer connect that we enjoy. We have always focused on creating a high performance bank focused on strong financials. Our capital adequacy ratio, CAR, which is one of the indicator of the stability of a bank stands at over 26%, nearly three times of the regulatory requirement. I am overwhelmed with what we have been able to achieve in these five years. This would not have been possible without the support and love of all our customers. They are the real reason for our growth trajectory. I think, I think, all the customers of the Bandhan Bank, the regulators, investors, board, well-wishers, and all those who have helped the bank directly or indirectly in the journey. Thank you for making this incredible story possible. In the first five years, Bandhan Bank was focused on further enhancing it's the key strength that is microcredit business, exploring and scaling up the offering to retail and micro enterprises and establishing a wide and vibrant branch banking network. While we grow bigger, we remain committed to cater to support the needs and aspiration of an e even large number of customers. In the first five years, Bandhan Bank has lowered its microcredit interest rate by nearly four and a half percentage points. Today, our interest rate is one among the lowest in the microcredit segment across the world. In the years ahead, Bandhan Bank will strengthen its position as a pan-India universal bank. Will not only expand our distribution, but also add newer products to serve varied audiences. We'll continue to grow the microcredit portfolio while moving towards a more even balance between secured and unsecured asset box. Affordable housing and MSME will be our other core focus areas. When I say affordable housing, I'm also referring to the micro housing segment in rural 
and semi-urban areas where access to formal credit is still a huge challenge. In MSMEs also, we'll focus more on the micro and small enterprises and partner them to graduate to medium enterprises. In fact, with our strong connect with the stunningly large number of micro credit borrowers, we aspire to continue to help a large number of micro enterprises move up to the core MSME segment in the coming years. Given how the last five years have been, the next five years look even more promising. I am sure Bandhan Bank will grow many times bigger and continue to change lives of the people. In the last five years, we have owned many awards and accolades for our business performance. But the most important award to all of us in the Bandhan Bank family is the smile on the faces of our customers. We'll continue our endeavor to bring joy to people's life. Stay focused to serve a varied set of customers without diluting our passion and commitment to partner the unbanked and underbanked in their journey onwards and upwards. Today's circumstances require us to stand by people, to support them in their journey back to normalcy. Bandhan Bank has always been committed to this and our resolve, our resolve is far stronger now than ever before. We believe in sabka bhala, desh ki bhalai, meaning in the welfare of everyone is the welfare of nation. This is the reason why this year we are not celebrating our foundation day. Yet we decided to continue with our anniversary lecture, which we institutionalized in 2017. I am pleased to welcome Dr. Krishnamurti Subramaniam, Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India as the speaker at this year's anniversary lecture. Dr. Subramaniam has witnessed the Bandhan Bank journey very closely prior to the role of the Chief Economic Advisor. He was a member of the board of Bandhan Bank and we were fortunate to have his guidance in the early years of the bank. It is a privilege to have him deliver the anniversary lecture on the topic post-COVID Indian economy and the role of banking. Without any further delay, let me invite Dr. Krishnamurti to take screen and deliver today's lecture. Thank you to all of you. Very good evening to all. <clears throat> Respected Chairman of Bandhan Bank and my beloved professor when I studied at IMC, Professor Anup Sinha. Ghoshta, as we very fondly call him, the CEO of Bandhan Bank, the person who is behind this five-year-old Bandhan Bank being better than many adults. All my former colleagues and friends at the, on the board of Bandhan Bank, all the dear employees of Bandhan Bank, investors and very dear customers. I must say, this is a very emotional moment for me as Ghoshda rightly mentioned, I had the privilege of being associated 
with uh, Bandhan Bank since its inception. And it's only the responsibility of this role uh, due to which I had to actually um, end my association. Um, though my association you know, from, from the heart still continues with Bandhan Bank. I'm reminded of a particular episode which will remain with me all through my life because it is something that in, in, uh, in all its spirit embodies what Bandhan Bank does. I recall in the incident when uh, in fe February of 2015, I happened to go and visit Kolkata on the request of Ghoshda. And at that time, he had requested me to be on the board of Bandhan Bank. It's quite uh, emotional because uh, it, at that time, my father, who has been by far the most instrumental in whatever uh, I have achieved, was alive. In fact, he passed away uh, a few months later in July of 2015. So after the request from uh, Ghoshda, I happened to go and you know, uh, meet him and told him about this opportunity. And I still remember his words. Uh, he had tears in his eyes when he said, you know, life has come a full circle. And he said that in English, he actually was a voracious reader, um, somebody who didn't get to get that much formal schooling, but was a very, very wise and you know, a voracious reader. He recalled an incident when he had borrowed a loan from a money lender. And I remember that money lender coming and asking for his, um, for his dues and watching, um, you know, as, as a young child, my father not being treated very well. I, I recall that incident. Uh, he remembered that as well. And he said, the fact that now uh, you will be associated with Bandhan Bank. And so no other Krishnamurti will get insulted the way um, your father on that day got insulted. So he mentioned that, you know, and, and that incident and that conversation that I had is what uh, keeps my emotional connection with Bandhan Bank and with, uh, with microfinance in general. Um, so it's a, it's a very, very happy homecoming for me in some sense. Um, I would like to, with all my heart, congratulate Goshta and all the um, different people who have been associated with Bandhan Bank right since its inception, to uh, who have worked very, very hard, toiled hard um, to, to bring Bandhan Bank to the five-year-old um, adult that Bandhan Bank has become. Um, when we joined Bandhan Bank, some of us at its inception, Bandhan Bank had 60 lakh customers. I'm told today it has more than two crore customers. And just to give us a sense of how many customers these are, the number of customers that Bandhan Bank has is more than the population of countries like Sri Lanka, Thailand, about the same as the population of a country like Australia, or Netherlands. In other words, Bandhan Bank serves customers that is almost the size of many countries. I think that gives us a sense of how much scale and what's the impact that Bandhan Bank has had. Um, in terms of its balance sheet size as well, if I recall correctly, at the time when we, we were associated with, at its inception, Bandhan Bank's assets portfolio was about 19,000, 20,000 crores thereabouts. Um, Today, it is four times as much, um, about 75,000 crores. So four times um, increase in balance sheet size in just a span of five years, I think it's testimony to um, you know, what Bandhan has achieved. And this has been done while ensuring that the quality of the assets remain you know, guilt-edged. 0.58% um, is something that is, you know, it's, it's, it's just phenomenal. Um, and I have seen why, why this happens, because I had the good fortune of, of attending some of the um, weekly meetings that are held, the group meetings. I've gone and attended these and seen the passion, the mission with which employees of Bandhan Bank 
serve bandhan for most employees of bandhan bank it's not a job that they are doing it's a mission and and that's the kind of you know missionary zeal that brings the kind of outcomes that bandhan bank has enjoyed um even talking to some of the customers and you know hearing them saying you know they 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 took me to be an officer as well dada amake amake arekta loan diye din um amar amar bachcha gulo ke actually school e pathate hoy Uh, you know those kind of stories i think is just phenomenal to hear by the way uh, i i'm just you know flaunting my bengali um, but bandhan has presence all over india today so i'm sure there are customers speaking in many other languages as well maybe saying in tamil for instance saying and a kinor loan venum um so uh, that's the kind of reach that bandhan bank has had um uh, what i want to do today given the given the um, you know times that we are going through i think there is a, a phenomenal amount of learning that we can have um, from the experience of bandhan bank um, and more broadly from the experience of microfinance itself because microfinance is a good example of how um, business you know can be and you know private sector solutions can indeed be actually uh, good for the nation as well um that it's not necessary that social good requires only the government to do it i think microfinance is a brilliant example of how uh, social good can be achieved while making private profits not profiteering but private profits and that of course has to be combined with a kind of ethics and governance that uh, you know that that bandhan bank has 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 implemented um so uh, let me let me uh, uh, use uh, this opportunity to share my thoughts on where indian banking needs to be uh, in order to replicate the kind of success that a bandhan bank has had um, microfinance sector has had thereby contribute to the economy uh, post covid uh, as we all um, you know uh, in our, in our walks of life recognize that in every crisis there is an opportunity and in the covid crisis there is an opportunity i am an incorrigible optimist and so i am just you know hardwired to look for opportunities in crises and therefore that's what i will focus on the opportunity that we have to you know really grow the banking sector uh, and thereby thereby uh, you know contribute to the growth of the economy so um my, i'm going to share my thoughts on the role of the indian banking sector um as i had mentioned if you notice the growth of the if you notice the growth of the of microfinance and microfinance is a good example of aapka bhala sabki bhalai uh, a, a a motive with which bandhan bank has itself worked this chart shows the number of clients uh, loans outstanding you know uh, the data is a little 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 older but it clearly shows the kind of growth exponential growth that microfinance has had and thereby has created impact so i want to use this to talk about the banking sector broadly uh, before i i get into the specifics i think it's uh, pertinent for me to also draw lessons from another very important event that happened in the last week and that is i'm talking about cricket the retirement of mahendra singh dhoni i would like to contrast and this is those of you who follow cricket would have definitely noticed um with a lot of uh, happiness the difference that dhoni's team in you know, the when the indian team walk on the park anywhere in the world under mahendra singh dhoni vis-a-vis -vis the team that we had in the 1990s the important difference while there are many what i want to draw upon is that the 1990s team was known for being tigers at home but lambs abroad so we used to win left right and center um, you know on tailor made pitches in the you know in india but when we went abroad whether it was australia south africa england we used to be found really wanting in contrast Mahendra Singh Dhoni's team before him another you know son from West Bengal um Saurav Ganguly brought that steel but what stand stands out with uh, Mahendra Singh Dhoni's team is that they went and achieved success everywhere in the world whether it was the Africa 
or the uh, 2011 world cup uh, in india or the uh, you know the, the champions trophy win in england they actually conquered the world i think that is a perspective that i would want to emphasize for the indian banking sector the reason this perspective is important is because i often hear many commentators saying that oh indian banking has done very well in the last 50 years undoubtedly you know and and i'm not going to deny that there has been significant success in the indian banking sector but i would want to use this parallel with the you know the comparison with the 1990s cricket team with the cricket team that mahendra singh dhoni headed what gives us indians pleasure is to actually prove ourselves you know in the world with the best in the world something that the 1990s team did not and that is why what i want to present to you now is the global perspective on how indian banking looks vis-a-vis -vis, you know rest of the world so the next chart here is actually uh, i'll come back to this chart in a minute but i want to uh, you know talk about the this chart which is very very important when we start thinking about the indian banking sector you know in a global context so this is the um, you know th this chart shows the number of banks in the global top 100 um, number of banks by country uh, notice that china has 18 banks in the global top 100 you united states has has 12 and these are the two largest economies in the world india you know i i'm sure all of us acknowledge is the fifth largest economy in the world so if the indian banking sector was proportional to the size of its economy you know the india should have been where south korea is which has had six banks in the global top 100 but in you know in contrast india has only one bank in the global top 100 and that too a 55th ranked state bank of india in other words you know when you take the global top 100 banks the highest ranked bank in you know from india is is 55th um, and you know while we while we are fifth in terms of the size of the economy only one bank uh, in the global top you know top 100 even countries that are a fraction of our size and i'll give you you know take finland finland is 1 1/11 the size of the indian economy denmark is 1/8 to the size of the indian economy norway 1/7 austria 1/7 belgium 1/6 you know these countries which are fraction of the size of the indian economy have one bank in the global top 100 you know if you take countries like sweden and singapore Sweden is one sixth the size of the Indian economy. Singapore is one eighth the size of the economy. They have three banks in the global top hundred. In other words, in other words, countries that are a fraction of our size have far more banks in the global top hundred. This is the first point that I want to actually put put across that the Indian banking sector cannot be satisfied with replicating the fortunes of the 1990s cricket team and saying, "Oh, we've done very well in India." That is what the 1990s team was was. But whenever we used to glow globally, we used to get you know all of us cricket uh, you know cricket fans used to get disappointed. That's the perspective you know the 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 the, the achievements that Dhoni's team has done. that's what should now be the goal of the indian banking sector because india is not any more a small economy we are the fifth largest economy in the world so this perspective i think is very important that change in mindset from patting ourselves on the back to being you know being tigers at home that has to change we now have to start evaluating ourselves in the global perspective a few more uh, you know few more uh, 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 charts to establish the same uh, aspect uh this shows a regression here of the number of banks in the global top 100 with the gdp you know plotted on the x axis why because it's possible that the size of the economy actually affects the the, the number of banks notice here that china is a positive outlier india is a significantly negative outlier you know for the size of its economy india's banking sector is extremely small um china is is a positive outlier us is basically just you know the banking sector is proportional to the size of its economy uh we can look at this in other ways um this chart shows actually the same thing with gdp per capita uh, which is how developed we are in terms of how which rich we are using the gdp per capita here as well india is a significant negative outlier china is a positive outlier so 
it's uh, you know even if we control for the effect of development on the you know in terms of the size of the banking sector using domestic credit to private sector india is a huge negative outlier and by far among all these economies that you see here you know which are shown india is by far the negative outlier in terms of the banking sector um one more one more uh, figure that i would want to show you here is you know people may say oh would this be possibly because we actually this is just a function of population um well that's not the case even if you control for population here which is what is being done you know china is a positive outlier and india is a negative out you know a, a by far the most negative outlier even when you control for the effect of population in other words the size of the indian banking sector the fact that it is so small compared to the size of its economy cannot be explained by the size of its economy cannot be explained by the gdp per capita or the fact that it, that we are a very large large country um it's it's you know any which way you look at in the data you know when you start basically applying the benchmark that are, that we want as we did you know when we when dhoni went and conquered the world with that benchmark the indian banking sector still is like the 1990s uh, indian cricket team uh, if you if you go and um, look at it in in other ways so this chart shows the credit penetration for um, for major economies the oecd economies um you know the the left panel shows the total debt as a percentage of gdp the middle one shows the government debt and the right one shows the private debt as a percentage of gdp notice that india's private sector debt is only 55% 54.8% percent to be precise the average in these countries is 160.4 in other words three times as much as india's so this is another way of looking you know as a percentage of its gdp how much credit has reached the banking sector this also shows you know a, the, what i have been trying to actually tell you that the indian banking sector has been extremely small compared to the to the size of its of its economy uh, so the basic point i'm trying to make here is that now in order for india to become a 5 trillion dollar economy the banking sector needs to be proportional at least proportional to the size of its economy if not bigger than the you know that that you know that that than the proportionality and why is this important um why is the size of the banking sector important for that let me go back to my uh, to a slide which we covered in detail in the economic survey of this year which is you know a lot of people for instance say oh the uh, the 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 impact on the economy is because of uh, you know various things like like gst or demonetization etc you know we showed it with very careful evidence that the slowdown in the in the you know in the economy be it in terms of investment consumption growth is actually stemming from problems in the banking sector those of you who are interested i urge you to go and read the first chapter in volume 2 of this year's economic survey uh, i'll give you the gist of the you know the, the empirical evidence that we provided there uh, and i'm going to lay this argument out in steps the first step was problems in the banking sector Uh, it started with bad loans and npas which now actually you know i think that is very well established the bad loans you know and the npa problem that resulted uh, because some of these npas also were created due to malified intent there was investigation that was done some of them possibly not very justified but as a result risk aversion among bankers has gone up significantly and it still continues to be a problem risk aversion among banks when bankers big you know become risk averse the first thing that suffers is corporate lending and so corporate lending has basically come down you know both due to demand side factors which i'll which i'll come to in a minute but the first step in this was supply side factors um, that banks basically reduce their lending you know of course nbfcs tried to fill the gap and then you know that's a different story maybe for another day how the uh, quality of loans in the nbfc sector also had an impact but the uh, simple fact remains that nbfc lending is primarily directed towards maybe very small 
small firms or to you know consumption based lending but investment based lending in india is done primarily by banks so the increase in risk aversion affected corporate lending significantly and that brought an impact on investment this was the first thing that actually got impacted that overall investment declined because the you know the supply side impact of corporate lending the impact of that investment then was felt on economic growth and this happens by the way all of you would acknowledge that you know in a in a in a large economy like india or in any macro economy these effects are felt with lags they are felt not immediately but with lags so the decline in corporate lending affected investment that in turn had an effect on economic growth now when economic growth slowed down that had an impact on disposable incomes and and thereby had an impact impact on consumption the decline in consumption then you know in the last step also affects investment because firms invest in anticipation of demand so the decline in consumption actually was the third step in this cycle but now that itself has also becomes you know uh, an an issue that we have to contend with so we are now in this uh, in the cycle where because of the you know anticipated decline in consumption investment is not picking up and thereby you know growth is also getting impacted so this is sort of the summary of what has happened of course there are fiscal aspects you know which one can go into uh, you know at 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 a later point in time maybe different different point in time but the essence of the crisis that we had you know has its has its origins in the banking sector now this brings me to the second problem which is quite important in the context of the indian banking sector which is that you know banking sector you know when we ask the question what is the role of the banking sector apart from providing lending you know in terms of the quantity banking sector also plays a critical role in allocating capital you know if banking sector is efficient it lends capital to those projects and firms that are really good but if the banking sector actually has not figured out you know or basically is not very efficient you know then the credit can end up going to bad firms firms that possibly you know don't have good projects maybe crony lenders etc and that then uh, creates npas if you look at the history of the indian banking sector starting from the 1990s we've had this problem where you know when the economy picks up banks basically start lending and then npas are created there was an earlier uh, you know crisis like this in the late 90s as well i remember before my phd working with a a project finance institution where in the late 90s we faced this problem of bad loans so that was actually something that happened you know we were able to get out of that because of increased growth but the lessons from that period were not learned and so we had a replication of that in the you know in 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 the in the in the recent crisis so the indian banking sector you know is some you know needs to deal with the scale issue which i have of course highlighted but it also needs to look at the models for corporate lending especially large corporate lending you know needs to figure out how to ensure that the lending is not given to those that actually are possibly the most connected but to those that have the best projects those that have the best governance those that actually have the you know the most demand to be able to cater to in other words those that are economically the best in terms of so that is an another aspect that you know the indian banking sector needs to it needs to needs to uh, sort of deal with which is both on the quantity and the quality of the of 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 loans uh so let me let me show some evidence on on this as well um so you know before i get into that i actually want to uh, talk about the low the, the impact of fintech um this is some research that actually has been published recently you know in 2020 which shows how technology can play a key role in both scale and in you know and quality of lending so what this chart shows is the performance of banks you know those that have high it adoption versus those that have low it adoption so the blue solid line that you see is for banks that had you know that had actually high it adoption um and those that you see basically the dotted line red dotted line is the low it adoption uh, on the left panel you see npas or uh, and on the right panel you basically see the the median share of loans scale in other words basically the right panel shows quantity the left panel shows quality what is very clear is you know this is uh, coincides with the crisis 
that those banks that had low IT adoption were the ones where the NPAs piled up significantly during the crisis. Not just that, they were the ones that actually did not grow adequately either. In other words, banks that had good, you know, high levels of IT adoption, had very good quality of lending as seen with, by the NPAs, and at the same time, were able to grow in scale as well. This is a very important aspect that I will come back to when I talk about some of the solutions for the, for, for, for the banking sector. Uh, but before that, let me, let me talk about the uh, use of data for, you know, for tackling the quality problem in lending. Uh, this chart shows the, uh, shows, you know, what the leading indicators that could have been used by Indian banks, um, and yet it was not used. So this chart shows the various accounting problems that were there in the largest defaulters. So, you know, uh, all of us have heard about this phrase called the dirty dozen. You know, this is the set of defaulters that was uh, that, that that the Reserve Bank um, you know uh, had had announced. So, without naming any of the company, what is being shown here is the kind of you know problems that were there in the financial statements about three, four, five years before the problems actually manifested. So, this is these are data you know financial statements as of 2013 2014 something that has been talked about in the economic survey so notice the kind of problems you know 3 4 years before the loans actually went kaput the indicators were very much there whether it was in terms of default in repayment of borrowings whether it was in terms of weakness in internal controls qualifies or disclaimers of audit opinion, insufficient provisioning, excess managerial remuneration. You look at you know the typical accounting problems, financial statement quality problems. The indicators were all there. So the point I'm making is, if Indian banks had used you know, and those especially those that lend to large corporates had used data and data analytics, they would have been easily been able to figure out that these are not the firms that they should be lending to. Uh, another way of looking at the same thing is this is basically showing the you know default performance of companies that do that did a lot of related party transactions. One of the easiest ways to actually you know figure out companies that are likely to be willful defaulters versus those that are not is look at related party transactions. And you know these are typically the kind of conversations that happen in a part you know in a in a evening party saying oh firm X has actually borrowed you know, a, a loan from bank Y and has then basically given a loan to one of its related party firms. But what this shows is that, you know, actual data also reveals here that if you look at the panel, the top panel here, which compares willful defaulters and non-defaulters, the willful defaulters by far did far more related party transactions. Um, if you look at their disclosure of related party transactions was very poor. That's what is being seen in this particular. So they were doing related party transactions, but hiding those related party transactions much more than non-defaulters. Um, the promoter hedging that was pledged, in other words, the skin in the game of the promoter was, was far lower in the case of uh, the willful defaulters. And they were giving, out, they were lo giving loans to related parties. Now, even if you do a comparison between willful defaulters and distressed defaulters, in other words, those that defaulted because they did not have the ability to repay, as in, you know, in, in contrast to the willful defaulters who did not have the willingness to repay, there as well you find that the disclosure of related party transactions was far lower for the willful defaulters. The, the promoter had pledged far more of their, their holding and therefore had slower skin in the game and were giving a lot more loans to related parties. Again, something that data should have revealed, and this is data that is again picked for 2014-15 that banks should have used if they had used the simple data could have actually told them the kind of loans that they should not be touching even with a barge pole and yet was basically not done. Um, if you look at the so 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 let, let me let me you know summarize these two slides here. What these basically are, are suggesting is that if banks want to invest in you know data analytics and technology, and today of course there's artificial intelligence, then it is possible to actually defeat the nefarious designs of the willful defaulters by using proper data because there are enough leading indicators available. And here I want to actually point out, uh, you know, uh, and, and 
uh, an important um, story. Right? It's not really a story; it's a fact. But I don't know how many of you have actually heard about this software called Deep Thought. Deep Thought is a is a software, chess software that was created uh, using artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, now, Deep Thought was not even rules of chess. It was just fed lakhs and lakhs of chess games. You know, in the the way chess is coded, it was you know fed those those games. The AI software with which uh, Deep Thought was built learned the rules of chess by reading those games. Then it learned the tactics and strategy you know required in chess and actually defeated Garry Kasparov. And those of you who follow chess will know that Garry Kasparov it has been by far the highest ELO rated player ever. And those of you who have played chess will also acknowledge that the kind of tactics and strategy, the possible combinations that are there in chess, is far, far more and orders of magnitude greater than any willful defaulter can come up with. In other words, the nefarious designs of a willful defaulter are childish compared to what actually a chess player, especially a grandmaster like you know, like like Gary Kasparov, can 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 indulge in. And yet, you know, the artificial intelligence-driven software could actually defeat the tactics and strategy of a, of a Gary Kasparov. If it can de defeat a Gary Kasparov, defeating the nefarious designs of a willful defaulter is actually kids' play for you know for for these kind of softwares. The point is, you know, are are bankers actually do they recognize this opportunity? Do they recognize that technology and analytics has that kind of potential, and therefore are willing to invest in creating that data? If they are willing to do that, to do that, then the opportunity is very much there. In fact, I would go go and you know go ahead and say this that some of this has existed for the last more than two decades. You know, I remember doing my BTEC thesis at IIT Kanpur on the application of neural networks in electrical engineering. Neural networks was the precursor to artificial intelligence. Now, you know, this is stuff that that was done 25 years back. So this stuff has been there. It's a matter of understanding the potential of this and implementing it. So to 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 summarize my thoughts at this point in time what i want to say is that technology you know gives the opportunity to be able to actually you know build the models to be able to do large corporate lending as well but that requires understanding of the potential of technology understanding the cutting edge in artificial intelligence machine learning etc because this is the this is what you know banks of tomorrow will be doing and indian banks therefore need to be investing in as well you know banks today internationally are, are primarily technology companies because they they use so much data and analytics to infer not only the ability to repay but also the willingness to repay there are several models now which use even psychological parameters and data relating to that to infer the willingness to repay so the opportunity is there to be able to and that's what the indian banking sector needs to be needs to be investing in um, why is this important because if you think about the opportunity cost to the taxpayer you know from just let's say from from public sector banks you know this is something that you know again i'm pulling it out from the economic survey where we did a chapter chapter 7 where we looked at the golden jubilee of bank nationalization if you look at the red bar here this is the foregone return on investment in public sector banks now all of you acknowledge that every rupee of taxpayer money that is spent by putting capital into public sector banks has an opportunity cost it could have been used to fund health education or social protection for rural development for maybe capital expenditures in railways or possibly the food subsidy because there are opportunity costs the point here being that the opportunity cost of tax money being put in the public sector banks is not trivial at all it is significant another way of looking at the same thing is that if governance and management in is improved here in these public sector banks you know the kind of gains that can be that can be generated those you know rival some of the large subsidies that we that, that 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 we have so suffice to say that the opportunity cost to the taxpayer you know from just the private from the from the public sector banks you know uh, in in going through these um, these these npas is actually large um, and and has you know you has 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 huge cost to the economy uh, so the the um, 
what we also need to think about, therefore, is about incentives. Um, you know, that some of the incentives for providing this capital need to be thought about. You know, in the interest of time, I'm actually going to uh, skip the details, but these are something that we have to work on. Uh, leapfrogging, pub, you know, public sector banks in, you know, in, in specific, but private sector banks also via fintech is really essential. And here's where the idea that we put forward in the uh, in the in the economic survey was that of a public sector banking network, which can pull in data from all the public sector banks that generates the scale to be able to implement analytics, uh, data analytics, AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and thereby be able to do you know underwriting and monitoring of the loans really well. Also pulling in data sources from you know entities like the GSTN to ensure that both ability to, to repay and willingness to repay is is really uh, you know is is really understood and modeled very well. Um, so public sector bank network can help reduce the risk aversion, something that I spoke about, because this would be technology driven and can thereby actually, you know, reduce some of the, 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 the factors that create fear, you know, from the three C's, the, you know, that, that, that we all know about in the Indian banking sector. And that's something that can be really useful in the, um, so uh, a few other suggestions for the Indian banking sector. I think India also needs more banks. Just to give you a, a benchmark, USA has, you know, one third of our population, about uh, 400 odd million people. In, you know, we are a population of about 1.35 billion. But the US has almost 20 times as much, you know, as many banks. In other words, you know, about 60 times as many banks, you know, per capita as India has. And this has impact on competition in the banking sector. Competition affects the transmission of you know, rate cuts and thereby in general monetary policy transmission. So this is something that also in, in the India needs. Um, private sector banks also need to invest in data analytics. As I was saying earlier, that you know, it's not just public sector banks. If you take the private sector banks, many of the private sector banks that have been in existence for long periods of time, they have, you know, when they've implemented technology and analytics, they've implemented that primarily in the context of retail lending, but they've not attempted as much to use data and analytics to figure out corporate lending, you know, especially large corporate lending, you know, where there is a huge opportunity, you know, as, as I've already uh, talked about. There's also an opportunity for DFIs for infrastructure financing, because that's also something that India really needs and possibly using FinTech uh, to enable, you know, entities like the post office service savings bank, you know, like uh, uh, to, to sort of create impact like Bandhan, Bandhan has been has been able to do. Uh, so, I, you know, at this point in time, let me let me conclude that the Indian banking sector across various categories needs to grow by leaps and bounds to become internationally recognized. The Indian banking sector has to actually only look at Mahendra Singh Dhoni and his team and compare that with the team that we had in the 1990s to say that today the, the Indian, you know, Indian customer, Indian citizen is not happy with just winning at home. The Indian citizen wants the, you know, whether it's a cricket team or the, the banker or the banking, you know, or the banks to go and win, you know, in internationally as well, not just be satisfied with, with being tigers at home. So the Indian banking sector needs to take that lesson and change its mission, stop patting its back actually by being tigers at home and really, you know, they seek inspiration from uh, Mahendra Singh Dhoni and thereby become internationally recognized. And technology provides that leapfrog, you know, and thereby a unique opportunity in a post-COVID. Post-COVID, you know, use of digitization is increasing significantly, which also thereby provides enormous opportunities for banking to actually, you know, to leapfrog technologically. The banking sector needs to seize these opportunities to support the growth of the Indian economy to become a $5 trillion economy. I'll stop there. Uh, thanks again. Thanks once again for uh, you know for your patient listening, um, and uh, I'll I'll uh, I'll be happy to take questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Subramanian, uh, for your thought-provoking and fascinating lecture. Uh, from some of us, uh, from myself and some of my colleagues in Bandhan Bank, one particular question you mentioned the importance of adoption of 
technology at this juncture. What is your expectation at this juncture? Do you think the COVID related crisis and the pandemic will eventually lead to faster adoption of uh, such uh, technologies at this juncture? Or it can actually continue to pose certain challenges uh, which might take far longer? Um, I think, Siddharth, um, the very fact that we are doing this event virtually, uh, something which, you know, absent COVID, we might have possibly been doing this in Kolkata physically, uh, you know, is illustration of the opportunities that are coming by. You know, as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. And COVID has actually created that necessity and thereby is creating, you know, you know inventions and innovations, uh, something that we are part of just now, you know, in this event. Um, COVID is, the, you know, the, the necessity, you know, created by COVID is throwing up enormous opportunities technologically. Um, you know, if, for instance, if you look at the gig economy, you know, those of, those of us who actually used to maybe go to restaurants to eat today, actually, you know, order a lot more online. Um, if you look at even, you know, in, in other countries, the uh, online shopping has increased far more. Overall, you know, because this is a shock that actually restricts physical proximity, requires social distancing, therefore, you know, technology is inevitable, in, you know, and, and maybe this is the shock that was required, you know, for the world in some sense to really adopt technology far more. And, and maybe this is my bias as, as someone trained as an engineer uh, that I look at it this way. But, but it is something that really brings in the role of technology. So I only expect the, uh, the, the role of technology to go up you know, going forward. And um, those firms, those entities that will see opportunities and, you know, and, and thereby stay ahead or at least you know, keep pace with the technological change will be those that will remain relevant. Uh, this is a disruption that is definitely happening. And those that will, you know, cling on to their old methods and, you know, and, and, and keep, keep insisting that, you know, that the world is not changing will slowly but surely find themselves becoming more and more uh, irrelevant. So I think technological change is, you know, is inevitable now following COVID. And especially for banks, I think this is an enormous opportunity, banks in India, to really utilize this, uh, this change. Very interesting to hear that, sir. Uh, before I hand it over to our chairman, uh, Dr. Anup Sina, one last question from my side. Uh, this particular question came to me from multiple colleagues of mine that, uh, as, as you spoke, that uh, what is your uh, take specifically on the Indian economy so far as the bottom end of the pyramid is concerned? At this juncture, over the course of the last few months, it, it faced a lot of headwinds. But do you think they will be resilient enough to bounce back quickly? or possibly a lot of supportive measures on the part of the government will be needed going ahead. The government and the policymakers are doing a lot, but do you think that they, are, they have actually regained the resilience they are, they are, they are uh, very, very uh, famous for? I think, uh, Siddharth, that's an excellent question. Um, so, I, you know, this question, I could speak for the next 30 minutes, um, but, but I'll try and keep my answer short. Uh, one about the um, you know about the the steps that have been taken by the government. Um, I think a lot of the measures taken by the government have been focused primarily on you know on on uh, trying and you know to limit the difficulties for the you know for, for those at the bottom of the pyramid, be it. Uh, increasing the you know the, uh, the the cereals that are being provided through the PDS system, um, you know the cash transfers that have been given to you know those that you know the poor people, um, together with uh, the the other um, measures that have been announced, you know especially focused on MSMEs because MSMEs you know are those that really cater to a lot of jobs at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, so as part of the Atmanirbha Bharat package, the 3 lakh crore credit that was, you know, emergency credit, credit lines that was directed to MSMEs, you know, that is something that has, that is quite important to, to consider. And in fact, that, that uh, the take up on, on that is, 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 is pretty, pretty, uh, you know, rapid. Um, so MSMEs are actually taking these loans to try and, you know, reduce the impact on the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, you know, what I do want to there, but, but talk about is 
the um, you know post covid um, the opportunity that lies at the bottom of the pyramid um, you know when you think about the uh, the, uh, the the clarion call that has been given um, by the honorable prime minister for atmanirbhar bharat um, you know here i want to actually contrast between two words that are very similar but have you know in the context of economics have very important uh, differences atmanirbharta means self reliance but self reliance has to be contrasted with self sufficiency because there is there is a you know a lot of people try you know confuse these and say oh is this a return to the pre 1990s era of uh, you know of basically import substitution and you know and return back from globalization etc no i want to make it very clear that self reliance is actually different from self sufficiency self reliance can only come when you have uh, you know when you have actually capabilities uh, you know in the whether it's an individual or a country let me take the let, let me take an example let's take uh, you know my alma mater and uh, you know uh, the institution that professor sina was also associated with as an example i am calcutta uh, if i am calcutta where to say that it will only admit you know students from bengal then you can think about how the what will be the impact on competition and the capability as well uh, capabilities are built through competition um, you know those that those of us who actually went to institutions like those we really were you know pushed by our by our you know peers by our colleagues and that's what actually happens in an economy as well and that's what you know for individuals and for a institution like bandhan bank it's that ability that actually creates a self reliance so for the economy too this is important to 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 make sure that we build capabilities but at the same time you know it's what we also have to understand is if we take the parallel many of us are parents you know we don't let a 5 year old kid let us basically learning to bike bicycle let's say to actually you know that we give it basically the kid a, a bicycle and say go and go and you know bicycle we give them training wheels till they actually learn how to you know how to actually ride on their own and that is something that paternalistic um, you know instincts you know drive us to protect them not always but till they actually grow and learn it's that's what creates that ability to be able to compete with the best and that is true for the economy as well so those sectors that have a lot of potential we need you know but we need to actually protect them from unfair competition when it when there is unfair competition but that is not protectionism it is just to enable them to become adults actually and thereby be able to compete so that's a key part and final point on this which is very important for our corporates to be to understand is that you know india is a population of almost 1.4 crore people therefore there is enormous opportunity at the bottom of the pyramid you know uh, ck prahlad who actually was one of the greatest thinkers of our time wrote about the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid if we take the various sectors that have actually utilized this microfinance is certainly one that has really catered to fortune at the bottom of the pyramid but another sector is you know fmcg for instance the only sector where you actually will see if you go to a village as well you want to buy dove shampoo you can get it in a sachet you can get it in a bottle as well you know people like us would buy it in a bottle but you could also buy it in a sachet which basically is a good example of tailoring the product to the bottom of the pyramid something that microfinance has done also very well that 20000 30000 rupee loans basically scale the product the size of the product down so that it actually becomes accessible to the bottom of the pyramid so the learnings from microfinance and fmcg these actually the rest of the sectors in india also need to have thereby create products and services you know for the bottom of the pyramid and that would mean playing the volume game not the margin game because you know when the strategy for being successful when you are catering to the bottom of the pyramid is scale and that means you have to work with small margins but very high volume therefore indian corporates need to you know sort of create move away from their focus on the top 25 30% where they actually can just you know benefit by playing the margin game to actually playing the the, the volume game and thereby craft products and services 
that are of good quality to be able to then export to the rest of the world. And that's where I think these nuances need to be kept in mind in order to be able to actually serve the bottom of the pyramid. That's when India will become really self-reliant and Atmanirbhar. Thank you very much, sir, for, uh, for your patience and, and, and uh, kindly explaining the details. I would now request Chairman of Bandhan Bank, Dr. Anup Kumar Sina, to propose the vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Siddharth. Uh, very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this, as you know, is a big day for Bandhan Bank. The bank turns five years old today. We kept the tradition of the anniversary lecture this year, although we moved it on to the online platform. I would like to thank Dr. Krishnamurti Subramaniam for delivering, as expected by me, a very thought-provoking and engaging lecture, really deep diving into the problems and the possible remedies for the banking sector. As an economist myself, I echo his thoughts and wholeheartedly believe that banks do have a very critical role to play in the resurgence of the economy. Uh, on a more personal note, as uh, Subramaniam already mentioned at the beginning that he was my student at IIM Calcutta, I can only feel very proud and also humble as uh, by the Indian tradition, as you know, the greatest reward uh, a teacher can get is when his student surpasses himself. So I'm really, really proud uh, to be, have been uh, Subramaniam's uh, teacher once upon a time. I would uh, also like to take this opportunity to thank all the members of the audience who are logged in into the lecture. It is the love and support of all of you and that of all our customers and well-wishers that the bank has been able to achieve so much in such a short span of time. I think we are ready to get off the training wheels, as he mentioned. I wish you all very good health. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and be optimistic about India's future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. It has been a pleasure to bring you this edition of Bandhan Bank's anniversary lecture. Today's event was attended by about 3,000 people. The webinar is now concluded.